So hey guys, this is Dan from LearningCameras.com and here I've got the Nikon D7100. Now we've had some time to use this, test it, put it through its paces. Now when this first came out, 24 megapixel camera, 100 view percent viewfinder coverage, dual SD card slots. The thing is just loaded with features. It really read like a photographer's dream. And Nikon made it happen, and they made it happen for $1,200, which is really an unbelievable price to pay for something like this. Now in that, you're also going to get weather sealing, you're going to get a lot of the professional features, 51 point autofocus system, uh, 15 cross type focus points in there. It really and truly reads like a dream spec camera. So let's put this to the test and see how it handles. Now when we take a look around the body of this camera, it really feels like a Nikon D7000 and a D600 kind of mixed and merged together. If you're a Nikon shooter on either one of those, you're going to feel right at home. If you're coming out from other systems, there are a couple things that are going to be a little different, some great, some iffy on there, and I'll kind of show you some of those. So, but one thing new that we have is the I button. Now the I button brings up some of the most used settings, or actually, I didn't find that these were settings that I used that much. The only one that I really went into is that new crop mode that they have to go between a DX crop and a 1.3X uh, additional crop on that. I did use this quite a bit. Great feature. I'll go into detail on that later. Uh, now overall, if you're coming from another kind of camera system, there are a couple things to keep in mind. Um, one is, even though the controls are pretty standard for Nikon, uh, there's a couple interesting things. One is you have quick access to a bracket button right here. That's very nice to have. I love having that. I'm not used to having that. If you love HDR, that's a dream come true. You do get five frames of auto exposure or if it expose your bracketing on this camera, which is just enough to do pretty much anything you could think of as far as HDR enthusiasts are concerned. Some of the cameras have seven or nine, but really and truly almost never use that many. So you're gonna really like what this has to offer. Um, another thing that's gonna be very interesting on this one is the uh, placement of the ISO and white balance buttons. You know, I will say I'm not a big fan. I have a hard time holding this to my eye and still accessing those buttons. So I really wish that they had moved them to the other side of the camera where you'll find them on most other camera systems. Uh, or if they had moved them up top like where you find them on the Nikon D800 and the Nikon D4. Getting into these are also shared with the, with the zoom buttons as well. So if you're actually looking at a picture or image review is turned on and you try to press that to change your ISO, it's actually gonna zoom in the image and not change your ISO. So just some things that are gonna take a little bit of getting used to on there. Now another thing that I gotta talk a little bit about is this locking dial here. We do have a locking dial, nothing wrong with this. We have similar locking dials on Canon's other systems. The secondary locking dial, man, if you can figure out how to move this with uh, one hand holding the camera and one hand on this lock dial and do it efficiently, all props to you. I really can't figure out how to do both at the same time and really pull it off extremely well. It's just kind of a pain to get to and a pain to use. Um, I mean, you can get it. It's not something that I use all the time, but it's just kind of, I'm just not a huge fan of the way they did it on this camera. Now, another thing we'll take a look at is the screen. It's a brand new 3.2 inch screen, 1.2 million dots. It's up from 920,000, I believe, in the previous cameras. Great screen, great looking. It's very sharp, uh, lots of contrast on there. Very bright, easy to see in just about every environment. The only thing I'm gonna say about it is that the screen, kind of reminiscent of some of the other Nikon cameras, does have a little bit of a yellowish green tint on it sometimes, and it does make it very difficult to get some very accurate colors depending on the situations that you're shooting in. Now another thing I'm gonna give Nikon a lot of praise for in this camera is uh, the OK button right here can be programmed to zoom in to 100% or different areas of the frame. That's nice once you take a picture and go to look at it and play it back, all you have to do is hit the, uh, hit the zoom button and it's gonna zoom you in right into the center of the picture. Very nice, you can check your focus really easily. I love having that around. Now another thing if you're coming from another camera system is keep in mind that the screen on a Nikon will not stay on all the time. It does turn off every time you hit the shutter on this camera. On some of the other ones it will stay on because they have a, um, a sensor judging for your eye. So on this one it won't stay on. That could be a, a little bit of a pain if you're tripod shooting or shooting at weird angles where you can't see the top of the LCD screen and you have to keep hitting the info button to turn it on. You know, not the biggest deal in the world, but I will say I really wish that they had done it a little bit differently with that. 
Now when it comes to the AF on this camera, a couple things to keep in mind. 51 points, 15 cross type. That's really kind of a dream AF system for a camera like this. Way better than we see at other systems in uh, similar prices to where that this camera is at. Now, um, a, a couple things that I will say, if there was no spot focus, which I'm used to on a Canon, which has a very, very small dot for focusing in on small, small areas of your image. And so when taking a picture of something like a bird or something like la that, I did find it a little difficult to get in and focus in on those very small eyes or things like that on the screen. But overall, I must say that I love it. The focus points on this camera fill up the frame all the way on the horizontal, almost all the way on the vertical. If you zoom in and use the 1.3 crop, you get even further filming of the, uh, filling of the frame with the focus points. Really kind of a dream come true when it comes to that. We get a lot of focus points spread out through the entire frame on this camera. The other thing I will say about the focus points, you do have 15 cross type focus points on there. Unfortunately, you know, they're a little uh, geared towards the center of the frame. They're all kind of grouped in the middle, so you don't have any of the cross type focus points on the outside, but you still have 15 to choose from, 51 overall. So I can't really diss it that much. It's still a great system and much better than we see on a lot of other cameras. And I really am happy with the focusing that is on this camera. Now when it does come to straight up image quality on this, I'm very happy with the pictures. You're talking about pictures that are full of contrast, they're sharp, they look perfect. Um, the only exception would be I did have some color problems when using the auto white balance. Depending on your lighting, if you get into kind of rough lighting, it does gear a little bit more towards kind of a yellowish green and it really is a little bit difficult to get auto white balance in those settings. Now I shoot raw so it's not a big deal. I recommend you shooting raw too if you're using this. If you are a video shooter or you do shoot JPEG, you might need to uh, experiment around with some of those custom white balance settings. Go into Kelvin, set your white balance ahead of time. I really wouldn't rely on the auto white balance for something like that. Now one thing that Nikon does a great job of, and this camera is no exception, is dynamic range. There is just a ton of detail filled into those shadow areas mostly. Not a whole lot on the highlights, more similar to what we're seeing with other cameras. But in the shadows, you can take a very underexposed image and boost it two to three stops. The image still looks good. You hardly add any grain. Uh, no, really, uh, no other issues that I was able to see inside the degradation of the, of the picture. Everything still looks great, even when boosting the shadows to that extreme. Dynamic range is really something that's excellent on this camera. So overall image quality looks great. Now when we start to get into our low light testing, uh, things looked very good at ISO 1600, really holding its own, almost no grain inside of the images. When we start to bump things up into 3200 ISO, we start to see the grain there. The picture still looks pretty good though, not seeing a whole lot of issues. Even, even in at 100%, it really doesn't look that bad very good for a, a crop sensor camera now shooting it up to 6400 iso you know even a lot of our pictures that we did shoot without zooming in on them they just they've lost their black levels they've gotten kind of a purple tint to them you're seeing the color noise creep in there the regular noise is in there it, it really is not usable for a lot of things up to, up at 6400 iso and more but i feel very comfortable using this camera at 3200 iso and below that's really impressive considering this is a 24 megapixel camera. This isn't some of the smaller uh, DSLRs that we're seeing with 12 megapixels, 16 megapixel, 18 megapixel sensors, 24 megapixels, and we're holding up very well at 3200 ISO. That's definitely impressive for Nikon on that. Now another thing is this crop mode. This crop mode is very interesting. It's unique to Nikon right now. We saw it first on the D800. It's also on this camera. That basically allows you to take this and uh, crop in on a picture, or not even crop in the picture, you're really just cropping in on the sensor. You're using only the centermost part of the sensor. It's gonna make your lenses look a little bit better because you're not using the outside of the lens and you're only using the best part which is normally in the center. And I use this feature a lot. It got me in really close, gave me that little bit of extra reach. I mean, if you get a 70 to 200 on this camera, at 200 millimeters with the crop factor of this camera, in addition to that extra 1.3 crop factor, you're shooting at 390 
millimeters. That's basically like having a 400 millimeter f2.8 lens on this camera. This is amazing. And you're able to shoot at ISO values, even with that up to 3200 ISO. Uh, this camera is gonna be great for sports photographers using that. They're gonna get a lot of, of zoom in on this. 400 millimeters at f2.8, that's like a $9,000 lens for something like that. And you're gonna get it all just on a camera, just like this. Now, when it comes to the video, the, the video actually is, you can crop it with that same 1.3x crop too, but I will say when we look at the standard video and uh, we take a look at the zoomed in video, you're gonna see a little bit later, I'm gonna show you some examples, but the 1.3x crop does not look quite as sharp. I'm not really sure exactly why that's going on, but let's go ahead and take a look at some of the video samples from this. Now the video quality actually looks very good. We're seeing sharp, uh, good looking images on pretty much everything on there. Motion looks pretty decent. Now when we uh, take a look at the crop factor, zooming into 1.3x using the crop factor tool, it just doesn't quite look as sharp. So I'm not sure what's going on there, but we're definitely not seeing the same results. Let's take a look again at the regular results. And uh, they just definitely look a bit sharper than with the crop factor. Now when we look at the rolling shutter, you know, we're definitely seeing it. Um, it's there, but it's there in every DSLR. There was nothing that led me to believe that the Nikon D7100 would be any different. So it's not significantly worse than anything else out there. But yes, you do have to deal with it if you're using any kind of a CMOS sensor, which we are in a DSLR. Now as far as autofocus goes, I was actually pretty impressed. It worked pretty quick. There's a bit of hunting around, but overall it did acquire focus and it did it in about three seconds and it did it pretty consistently on there. And as long as you were looking at a good object, it maintained it. And that's more than we get on other cameras like Canon who doesn't have any kind of autofocus. Now as far as Moray and aliasing, you know, it's there when we um, pan around, especially we can see the aliasing. Moray is not really bad. It's actually much better control than I thought it would be, considering that there is no AA filter on the Nikon D7100. Even with these uh, brick walls, we're really not seeing a lot of it. But yes, if you pan around a little bit, you are seeing some aliasing on there. It's, it's well controlled enough that it's not a big deal. Um, certainly better than I thought it would be on this camera. Now when we take a look at the uh, low light test, at 1600 ISO, everything looks pretty good. Everything is very clean. Now when we bump that up to 3200 ISO, it still looks reasonably good. Uh, nothing, nothing iffy on there. Where we start getting into trouble is uh, 6400 ISO. And as we take a look at that, we can begin to see quite a bit of grain in there. The image is noticeably deteriorating. Uh, it seems to be our limit is about 3200 ISO on this camera. Now as far as an actual video test, this is filmed at 3200 ISO and we'll take a listen to the onboard mic on the camera. <laughs> So this is a demonstration of what's involved with changing your aperture in live view or movie mode. Right now I'm in the video recording live view and we can notice that I can change my shutter and then I can change my aperture but nothing happens with the aperture change. So in order for me to get a proper exposure, I actually have to exit out of live view and then I can uh, change my uh, aperture and uh, then I can get the correct exposure. Then I'll actually have to go back into live view and now I can see my exposure and I would need to repeat this process over and over again. Now here's an interesting thing. Flip over to the photo mode and now I can change my shutter and my aperture actually changes on the screen but nothing happens. So it's not reflected on the screen and so I actually have no idea what my exposure might be uh, even when I look through the screen. So the only thing I have is my exposure meter down at the bottom, and if I go to take this picture, the um, picture is probably going to be completely underexposed, and yes, it is completely underexposed, even though my exposure looks fine on the screen. So you need to be extremely careful not to touch the aperture in live view, because I could easily accidentally be changing the exposure and not even realize it. 
Now, as of today, and this is obviously subject to change depending on when you're reading this, this is definitely the best camera on the market today in this price range for sure. For $1,200, you really get an unbelievable camera. I'm gonna be putting this as the test against the 7D to see what it holds uh, in a side-by-side -side test, but overall, I've been much more impressed with this camera as a whole. It's got a lot of new features that we don't get with the 7D. Now, the 7D is a, a three, four-year-old camera at the moment, but it is actually still selling for more than this camera when it first, when it first comes out. So that's really a negative for the 7D. It is still competing with this camera, $200 more expensive, I think, uh, even with three, four-year-old technology in a lot of areas. Overall, this is just an unbelievable camera. It is uh, really second to none in this area. Now, there's a, qu a couple little things that I said with the, uh, with the tinted screen, with a secondary mode dial, with um, some of your other aperture settings and not being able to change those, some of the button placements for the ISO and the white balance. But you know what? All of those are issues that you can get over. They're issues that you can learn to deal with. And even though you don't like them and it might be frustrating at times, they don't affect the picture quality of this camera. They don't affect uh, basically getting the picture. Anything that helps you get the picture that you want, that is all gonna be in this camera. They really made no compromises on this camera that I can think of, especially given the low price point. So video users could have a couple of issues with some of the features on this camera, uh, notably the, the not being able to change the aperture while shooting or in live view, not being able to change the audio while shooting, uh, the white balance possibly as well if you use auto white balance in your video shooter. But overall for everyone else, that's, if that doesn't bother you, this is really a phenomenal camera. Uh, you're not gonna get something better than this in this price range for sure. Now Nikon really hasn't done a lot new in this camera. But the, what they have done is they've taken the best elements from every other camera that is in their lineup and they put it all in this camera and only charge $1,200 for it. This is really amazing. Uh, you're going to get a camera with a professional feature, a professional feel to it. It's going to be weather rated for rugged use. It really feels like a small professional crop sensor camera. It's going to be great for sports. It's a no compromise camera for, only, for a compromise price. 1200 bucks gets you a starting point for a really phenomenal DSLR with a Nikon D7100.